All right. Well, everybody is showing up now. I see those participant numbers showing. They are going up and we are really excited today. I am so happy to have Sarah back with us to talk about her amazing topic. I am like thrilled that she's going to be talking about writing and <laughs> I love stuff dealing with character driven stories and uh, protagonists and all of that. That's definitely my wheelhouse. And so as everybody files in, I'm just going to wait for a few more people to show up and then I'm going to introduce you um, to Sarah. Thanks again, Sarah, for coming. We are just really happy to have you. Oh, you are so welcome, Amy. I'm very happy to be here today. Awesome. All right, just a few more seconds and I'll introduce you to our lovely host. Okay, so this is Sarah Letourneau from heartofthestoryeditorial.com. She is the book coach, editor, and writing workshop instructor at Heart of the Story editorial and coaching services. She especially enjoys working with female identifying authors, entrepreneurs, influencers, and other writers to help them develop the skills, knowledge, and confidence they need so they can finish their manuscripts, ensure they're ready for publication, and achieve their writing and publishing goals while embracing their most authentic creative selves. Her expertise ranges from speculative fiction, literary fiction, and YA fiction to memoir, business books, spiritual, and self-help nonfiction. Sarah is also the author of the poetry collection Wild Gardens, which is coming soon from Cal State Books, and the co-founder of the Pour Me a Poem Open Mic in Mansfield, Massachusetts. Her poetry has appeared in and numerous literary journals, magazines, and anthologies. And you can learn more about working with Sarah at heartofthestoryeditorial.com. And Sarah, thank you so much again for coming. I just, I'm just super excited um, to have you back as a sponsor this year. And you are a sponsor for um, last year's and this year's summit. So we're hoping to see you again. And we are so excited to learn more about what you have to tell us today. And I'm going to pass it on to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm just going to give me a moment here. I'm just going to start sharing my screen so that you can see the presentation slides. Awesome. Screen sharing. Ooh. Amy, I have see a message here that says the screen sharing is paused. Is something going on here? Let me see. It looks okay to me. I think okay. um, everyone else okay. can see it. I think I see people coming in in the chat saying they can see it. So. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. I saw something on my end that said the screen sharing is paused. If at any point you can't see my slides, please let me know. Or Amy, just feel free to just jump right in and let me know. Um, but sure. we will just I'll, rock I'll and here. roll from here. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so today we're going to talk about character arcs and story structure. Um, now, a lot of writers ask me, what's more important, the plot or the character's journey? You know what my answer is? Both. Because, you know, when I do a developmental edit of fiction or when I'm coaching writers, um, I like to help each writer ensure that they are cons considering both sides of this equation. The external, which is the plot, and the internal, which is what's happening to the character. That way they're hitting all of the important story beats while showing the emotional and psychological journey their protagonist is taking. Now, today's webinar is meant to be an introduction to this method of pairing story structure with character arcs. So we've got a lot Sorry, to cover. Sarah, I hate to interrupt you really quickly, but I think the screen is doing something kind of funky right now. <laughs> Apologies. I don't on? know why it's doing that. Okay, it looks good now. Uh, I think we just lost you for a second, but now we're on the first slide. Okay. Does it still say aligning the protagonist's journey? Yes, yes. Okay, the date. all right. Okay, good. So... We're just gonna move right on to the next slide. 
um, just to make sure that we keep things going. Um, so I know Amy just introduced me a moment ago, but hi everybody, I'm Sarah Letourneau, um, the book editor and writing coach behind Heart of the Story Editorial and Coaching Services. I am was one of the sponsors for the 2024 Women in Publishing Summit. So I work in both fiction and nonfiction. In fiction, I specialize in speculative fiction, so fantasy, science fiction, magical realism, as well as YA fiction and literary fiction. And with nonfiction, um, I focus on memoir, self-help books, and business books. I am also an award-winning poet, and my debut poetry collection, um, like Amy said, is coming out very soon from Kelsey Books. It's called Wild Gardens. And finally, I live in the greater Boston area of Massachusetts. So we've got a lot to explore today and we will dive in shortly. But first, here is what you can expect during today's webinar. So we're going to start with a different way to approach story structure in case the traditional three act structure isn't working for you. Next, we will talk about why it is so important to know your protagonist deeply before you begin writing and the four questions you can ask to help yourself and your story reach that depth. We will wrap, um, after that, we will begin aligning your protagonist's journey by focusing on each act of a story and the primary plot points. And then we'll wrap that off with some brief closing thoughts. Um, and since I am one of the sponsors for this year's summit, I will also take a moment to share how I can support you and your writing, regardless of whether you need help with the stories, plot, character arcs, or anything else. And um, we will wrap things up with a Q&A session where you can ask questions that came up for you while you were watching this webinar. How does that sound? All right, well, let's first talk about story structure, or rather, a different perspective on it. Now, if you have studied story structure before, you have probably heard of the three-act story structure. It's one of the most classic and widely used formats for storytelling, and it divides the story into three parts. Act one, which is the first quarter of the story. Act two, which is the longest act and takes up the middle half of the story. And act three, the final quarter of the story. Now, acts one and three are typically easier to plot, partly because they're shorter, but also because they contain some of the most crucial plot points in a story. For instance, act one features the inciting incident near its beginning and ends with a plot point I like to call the point of no return. We will talk about these and other plot points later in this webinar. As for Act 3, it begins right after the Dark Night of the Soul and ends shortly after the climax once any loose ends have been tied up. Now, Act 2 does contain the middle point, which occurs roughly halfway through the story. But writers often forget that this important plot point needs to happen to bridge the gap between the end of Act 1 and the beginning of Act 3, or also the end of Act 2. But do you see what else happens here? There is a lot of ground to cover during Act 2. And because the midpoint is sometimes overlooked, and the biggest events typically happen earlier and later in the story, it's easy to have only a fuzzy idea of what needs to happen in the middle. It's often why the middle of the story is often called the messy middle. And this is what often leads writers to struggle through this part of the story, no matter if they're plotting, pantsing, or using a hybrid of those two. So, Here's the perspective shift I want to share with you. And it's a methodology that other storytelling experts have offered, but it's not very widely used. What if you divided your story into four acts instead of three? 
to do this, you're not really doing anything revolutionary. Rather, you're going to cut act two into two parts so that you have four roughly equal acts. Act one would still represent the first quarter of the story. The new act two would begin right after the point of no return and end at the midpoint. That would be followed by the new act three, which would end with the dark night of the soul. And finally, act four, which was formerly act three, would start with the dark night after the dark night of the soul and go all the way to the end. Thinking about story structure this way places just as much emphasis on the midpoint as it does on any other plot point you see on the screen. That way you can treat the midpoint with the same care and consideration as you would with the inciting incident or the climax. This also means you would be building a smaller bridge of scenes, so to speak, between major plot points. If you look at this diagram again, you can see the amount of page time between the point of no return and the midpoint is much less than between the, mid, the point of no return and the dark night of the soul on the previous page. So by breaking your story structure into four equal acts instead of three acts of varying length, you can make this process of connecting the dots in your story less overwhelming. Does this way of looking at story structure make sense to you? Maybe give some hearts or some thumbs up if you have any, you know, I see a thumbs up, I see a heart, I see more, awesome. Okay, I'm really, really happy to see that, thank you. All right, so now, let us consider what is important for you to know about your protagonist before you begin writing and working with this methodology. First, who is your protagonist? What is her name? How old is she? What roles does she play in her everyday life? What is important for the reader to know about this character as the story begins? Now, these all seem like minor details, perhaps, but your readers will be curious to know who this character is and what she is like very early on. Next, what is your protagonist's story goal? In other words, what is the problem she is going to work towards solving during this story? Your answer to this question would also be the same answer you would give to the more frequently asked what is this story about? Third, why does your protagonist want this goal? What is her motivation for solving the problem in the first place? Let's use a very well-known example, Katniss Everdeen from The Hunger Games. Her story goal is to survive by winning The Hunger Games. But why is she doing this? What caused her to enter the games in the first place? Because she took her younger sister, sister's place in the event. In other words, Katniss chooses to step into this battle royale because of her primary motivation. She wants to protect her family. Now, this fourth and final question is the most important one in this process, and it's also the most challenging one. What false belief does your protagonist have that will be challenged by the story's events? This is a concept I learned from Angela Ackerman and Becca Puglisi, the authors of The Emotions Thesaurus and many, many other resources for writers. A false belief is an untruth that the character has been conditioned to believe about themselves or the world at large. Some examples of these distorted beliefs include, I can't trust anyone, or I am ugly, or not good enough. These may sound familiar because these are beliefs we often have about ourselves. And just as certain events in our lives can teach us that these beliefs are simply not true, the same can happen to the protagonists in the stories we write. Now, 
why is it important to know your protagonist on such a deep level? First of all, for a character arc to be believable and engaging for your readers, your protagonist must be emotionally invested in the results or consequences of the problem she wants to solve. Simply giving her a story goal that sounds cool might not work if she doesn't care about what happens afterward. So choosing a story goal that's connected to one of your protagonist's fears, a long-held dream, or the like will make the story more interesting for your readers. Also, giving your protagonist a false belief to unlearn will make her feel like a real person. Remember what I mentioned on the previous slide. We all have false beliefs about ourselves or the world. And we often go through circumstances that teach us how we've been wrong all along. So giving your protagonist to ch the chance to do the same will create more internal conflict within her and make her seem even more realistic. Finally, a false belief is often the result of a person's traumatic experience or emotional wound. In other words, when we adopt a false belief, or in this case, when your protagonist adopts a false belief, it's a reaction to something from her past, something that happened before the story, so to speak, that caused her a great deal of pain. So just as we do it in real life, your protagonist will do this to avoid experiencing the same pain in the future. But in the end, that belief is going to do her more harm than good, right? So as you consider your protagonist's false belief, think about what event from her past may have caused her to adopt this belief. And consider what kinds of appropriate behaviors or personality traits she may demonstrate because of this belief. Okay, that should be enough background information to give us the understanding we need for the rest of this webinar. Who is ready to start aligning the character's journey with the story's plot? Any emojis? More hearts? More, more awesome? We've got thumbs up. We've got celebrations. I love that. Awesome. So let us start with act one. A great way to refer to this first act is the introduction to the protagonist's normal world. Of course, we know that any sense of normalcy your character may have been living with will be turned upside down by the end of act one. But generally, these are the three primary intentions of act one. It introduces the, the reader to the protagonist, as well as some of the most significant people in her life right now. It shows the protagonist living in her world as it is right now, before the story's events cause things to change too much. And it introduces the problem your, your protagonist will work towards solving during the story. Now, remember the four questions we discussed a moment ago? Who your protagonist is, what her story goal is, why she wants that goal, and what her false belief is? This first act is where your answers to those questions will help you build out the external events that will catalyze your protagonist's internal journey. That's why it is crucial to take the time to answer those questions. Knowing your protagonist deeply will guide you in how to craft the rest of the story. Starting with the inciting incident. This is the first major plot point in a story, usually happening around the first or second chapter. That way, it can grab the reader's attention quickly so they're not left wondering when things are going to start happening. Now, remember that we are looking at the story's plot as a problem protagonist needs or wants to solve. A problem originates when an event occurs or a choice is made that upsets the balance in your character's life. So the inciting incident is intended to force your protagonist to react or make her own decision that will make it impossible for her 
to ignore the problem she needs to solve. If we return to our example from the Hunger Games, this is the scene when Katniss's younger sister, Prim, is chosen to compete in the games. And Katniss, who feels responsible, as if she hasn't done enough to protect her sister from being selected, volunteers to take her place. So when you consider your story's inciting incident, think about these three important points. First, figure out how your protagonist reacts to this event. What is she thinking? How is she feeling? Most importantly, what does she do by the end of this plot point that creates the problem she needs to solve? What choice does she make? What action does she take? And remember, your protagonist needs to be emotionally invested in the consequences of the inciting incident and every plot point in this story. So think about why she reacts and makes a decision in the way she does during this scene and how that ties in with her motivations. <clears throat> Finally, ask yourself how your protagonist comes face to face with her false belief during this scene. How does the lie your character believes about herself or the world at large flare up right now? Does that influence her reaction to the inciting incident? So we have reached the end of act one and the second plot point, the point of no return. This comes about 20 to 25% of the way through a story. During the time between the inciting incident and this plot point, your protagonist will be aware of the problem she needs to solve, but she won't be fully committed to it yet. Maybe she'll waffle back and forth for a bit before knowing what to do next. Maybe her false belief will be at war with her motivations. Or maybe other events need to occur first before she can commit to her part in the main conflict. That's the case with Katniss in The Hunger Games because she has to travel to the capital and train for the games before she can set foot in the arena. In all likelihood, your protagonist needs to experience a combination of all three scenarios throughout Act One before she decides, okay, I'm in. And that's because the point of no return involves a choice and an action from the protagonist that shows she is now committed to solving the problem. And there's no going back from here. After this, her life will never be the same again. In Katniss's case, her point of no return is when she's demonstrating her archery skills in front of the game makers. And to get their attention, she aims an arrow at their banquet table and skewers the apple in the roast pig's mouth against the wall. That's one heck of a way of saying, I'm ready to fight for the people I love. Don't you think so too? So when your story reaches the point of no return, here are the questions you can ask yourself. What kind of event will take your protagonist by surprise, just as the inciting incident did, and convince her to take action and start working on the problem she needs to solve? How does your protagonist react to this event? Again, what is she thinking? How is she feeling? How does this influence her reaction as well as the choice she makes here? The purpose of this plot point is that your character will choose to take action so she can start solving the problem. So think about how this choice aligns with her motivations too. For instance, what action could she take in response to the no point of return that will help her work toward her motivation? If she doesn't take action, how would her inaction make it harder for her to achieve that motivation? And remember your protagonist's false belief here too. When your character chooses to take action, how does this action put her in direct conflict with the lie she believes? Another way to think about this is, how does her choice force her to take the first step in confronting her false belief? 
So the point of no return doesn't just mark the end of Act 1. It also marks the beginning of Act 2, where your protagonist's adventure truly begins. Now, your protagonist might not see this as an adventure. In fact, she will probably resist and struggle with the story's events during this act and with herself internally. But this is where things start to get juicy from both plot and character art perspectives. And that's because of these three intentions of act two. Act two shows your protagonist taking the first steps towards solving the problem that represents her story goal. Now, the protagonist won't approach this process perfectly. Because she is still clinging to her false belief, she will make mistakes and experience challenges that align with this lie. So plan to make things difficult for your protagonist throughout act two to illustrate her internal conflict outwardly and to demonstrate how she's not gonna change right away. But you still want to show glimmers of hope for your protagonist. Maybe she is reminded of the motivation that's compelling her to solve her problem. Maybe she receives help from other characters or an object that will be useful to her later. Or maybe she meets characters who act as mirrors and she realizes how these characters reflect who, who she could be if she lets go of her false belief and who she could be if she hangs on to it. Using a blend of these scenarios in Act 2 will give your protagonist the tools and ideas she will need as she works on solving a problem. And this will plant the seeds of change in her mind. As we discussed earlier, this next major plot point is one that is sometimes overlooked by authors. So when I say that the midpoint, which I also like to call the revelation, and you'll see why shortly, is one of the most pivotal scenes in your story, it's for good reason. The midpoint occurs at the end of act two, around the story's 50% mark. At this point, your protagonist has been working on, res on solving the problem. However, as we mentioned a moment ago, she hasn't experienced a lot of progress or success just yet. Why? Because she is reluctant to see what her life could be like if she lets go of the false belief that is keeping her stuck. That's where the purpose of the midpoint comes in. During this scene, something shakes up your protagonist's world yet again. This shakeup prompts your protagonist to see the error in her ways. And by the end of the scene, she realizes she will need to change or do things differently if she wants to fulfill her motivation and solve her problem. This leads her to make another choice, one that doesn't necessarily indicate she's shedding her false belief just yet because she will continue to struggle with it as you'll find out shortly, but it's still a choice that steers her in the right direction. That is why I've nicknamed the midpoint, the revelation. Now, we haven't forgotten about Katniss. If we look at the Hunger Games novel again, we will find that the midpoint occurs when Katniss allies with Rue, one of the other contestants, and a girl who reminds Katniss of the sister she wants to protect. Together, Katniss and Rue destroy the stockpile of supplies some of the other contestants are hoarding. Before this moment, Katniss had been reluctant to actively participate in the games, so she had been hiding and biding her time. But this scene is where she moves from waiting and reacting to being more proactive. Your protagonist is going to become more proactive at this point, too. Here are the questions you can answer about the midpoint to help her move in that direction. What kind of event will shake up your protagonist's world yet again? How does your protagonist react to the midpoint? What thoughts and emotions does she experience? Most importantly, how does this event prompt her to reflect on the mistakes she has made so far? 
Remember, she is not going to reject the lie she believes just yet. Rather, she sees the promise of the opposite belief, the truth you are moving her toward, and she's going to take her next step toward believing that truth and solving her problem. So as the midpoint ends, what choice does your protagonist make that will help her move toward that truth and experience more success as she works on solving her problem? And what action does she take? Keep in mind that because your protagonist is now moving in the right direction, the action she takes during the midpoint should yield desirable results for her. Now, as we mentioned earlier, when this idea of three acts instead of four was being introduced, this act three is not the final quarter of the story. It, rather, it is the second half of what was originally act two. We have just passed the midpoint and your protagonist now has an improved approach to solving her problem. This means that act three will show that your protagonist is not only feeling more energized and motivated, but she's also going to experience more success as she works toward her story goal. Now, this often gives act three a feeling of, well, it reminds me of military scenes in TV shows or movies where the general yells, charge, and begins leading their troops confidently into battle. That's the sort of attitude your protagonist will have, too. She'll continue to receive assistance from other characters and tools or knowledge that will help her during the upcoming climax. And she will make better decisions that align with her motivations, and she will take more action to solve her problem. But do her newfound confidence and decisiveness mean that she is riding off to victory this soon? No. Your protagonist will receive more reminders, maybe even warnings, of what may happen if she doesn't solve her problem. And she will still make mistakes now with them. Why? Because deep down, she is still hanging on to her false belief. Even if a person changes their behavior because of a of a shift in perspective, they still have to believe in that perspective shift for things to work out. And since your protagonist hasn't quite taken that leap yet, this will ultimately lead to the end of act three and the fourth major plot point in your story, the dark night of the soul. This plot point typically comes around the story's 75% mark. And it's the moment where the worst thing your protagonist could experience as she works to solve her problem happens. It's not just another shakeup in her world. This event is the worst possible setback in, your, in her progress toward her story goal and in her emotional journey through the story. In fact, this setback poses so deep a threat to the protagonist's chances of solving her problem that she is seriously considering giving up on it altogether. In her mind, this goal, this problem she's been trying to fix is simply too hard and the odds appear to be stacked against her. And yet, something about this event prompts the protagonist to reflect on things once more. In this way, the dark night of the soul is like the midpoint. During both scenes, the protagonist is compelled to think about what just transpired, what it means for her, and how she needs to change moving forward. What's different this time is that she realizes that letting go of her false belief and accepting the opposite truth Maybe the only way she will succeed in solving her problem. So, where does Katniss's Dark Knight of the Soul occur during the Hunger Games? There's a lot of debate about this, but in my opinion, it happens when she's in the cave taking care of Peta, who is seriously injured. By this point, Katniss has lost her first ally, Rue, who was killed 
earlier in Act 3. And after the game makers announce a rule change that allows two tributes from the same district to win the games, Katniss realizes that if she wants to survive and win, she has no choice but to not only ally with PETA, who she has avoided most of the time they have been in the arena, but to also embrace the love story about her and PETA that PETA has been telling the world. So let's think about how the dark night of the soul needs to play out here. What is the worst possible setback your protagonist could experience at this point in the story? How does this negatively impact her progress towards solving her problem? How does your protagonist react to this? Again, what thoughts and emotions does she experience? Now, here's the most important question to answer about this plot point. How does the dark night of the soul prompt your protagonist to reflect on her journey and her false belief yet again? What causes her to realize that her motivation for solving the problem is greater than the lie she has believed for so long? And what choice does she make that represents her first step toward moving on from the dark night of the soul and her rejection of the false belief so that she can start to embrace the truth? What action does she take that represents this shift within her? All of these shifts that occur during the dark night of the soul are what bring the protagonist and your readers into the fourth and final act of your story. Act four is where you deliver on your story's big promises. Your protagonist now has all of the allies, tools, and knowledge she needs to prepare for the story's most important plot point. And because of all the help she's receiving, she may have what looks like a solid plan for solving her problem during the climax. And while she may feel nervous knowing that the big moment is just around the corner, she'll also feel a certain confidence she didn't have earlier in the story. This won't be the same reckless overconfidence she may have experienced at the act of act end of the be <laughs> at the end of act three, excuse me. Rather, she will be nervous about embracing the truth that's overriding her false belief, since it's still new to her. Yet, she will also feel a quiet sense of certainty. Think of it as hope that maybe, just maybe, she will finally get things right this time and solve her problem. These are the kinds of scenes and emotions to plan for your protagonist as she makes her final steps toward the climax, the fifth and final major plot point in your story. The climax comes around the 90 to 95% mark of your story. So not quite at the end of act four, especially if there are loose ends that need to be tied up afterward, but close enough that it begins to wrap things up without leaving too much page time left over. Now, you may typically hear this scene described as the final showdown between the protagonist and the antagonist. And while that may be true for your story, it's much more than a big battle of good versus evil. If we stick to the language we have used since the beginning of this webinar, the climax is the moment where your protagonist finally solves her problem successfully. Not only that, but she also fulfills her motivation for wanting to solve the problem in the first place. This is the case with Katniss. In the climax of the Hunger Games, we see her win the games and fulfill her motivation of surviving and protecting her family. Of course, the climax of the Hunger Games is not so simple. After another last minute rule change, Katniss is not the only winner. She and Peta win together after finding a loophole in the game maker's rules, which complicates Katniss's feelings about Peta further as they prepare to come home. Now, what about your protagonist and her journey to shedding her false belief? This is why I often nickname the climax, the moment of truth. This scene marks the first time when your protagonist demonstrates her commitment 
to the truth she has finally begun to believe. This means that something about her actions during the climax will symbolize her belief in this truth and prove that she has indeed begun to change. Okay, let's recap what's most important to consider about the climax from both plot and character art perspectives using these questions. How does the climax show the protagonist solving her problem? Is she confronting a character who is an antagonist? Or is this an internal conflict that only she can overcome? How does the way in which your protagonist solves her problem allow her to fulfill the motivation that's been driving her all story long? And as she solves her problem, what action or gesture does she perform during the climax that demonstrates her commitment to the truth that is replacing her false belief? And finally, what is the outcome of the climax? What is your protagonist thinking and feeling as the scene ends? That was a lot of information, wasn't it? But I hoped that it has helped you look at story structure and character arcs from a fresh perspective. And I appreciate all of you for sticking around to this point in the webinar. Oh, thank you for the heart. I really appreciate that. Um, so now I want to share some closing thoughts with you about aligning your character's journey with story structure. And I also want to share a special opportunity that you may want to take advantage of. So first, remember that the dual purpose of the methodology we discussed, when the plot and the protagonist's arc work well together, they create not just a good story, but a powerful, moving one that holds the reader's interest because every scene has a purpose and because the reader feels connected to the protagonist in some way. If a story focuses too heavily on the plot, it could result in overlooking the emotional aspects of the character's journey, and your readers might feel like something vital is missing. On the other hand, if your story relies too much on the character's arc, it may lead your, story, your readers to wonder when things will start moving forward. It may be too slow paced in some points. So by keeping both the plot and the protagonist's arc in mind, you will increase your chances of crafting a balanced, engaging story that will make your readers feel like they have gone on an incredible journey with your character. Now, there is one plot point we had to skip due to time constraints, the resolution. This scene, or in some case, a series of scenes comes after the climax. And its intention is to tie up the loose ends in both the plot and your protagonist's arc. So as you work on the climax, think about what needs to come after that scene to complete your character's journey and answer your reader's remaining questions. Finally, what if your story features an antagonistic character who's in direct conflict with your protagonist? Or let's say you're, you're writing a survival story and maybe your protagonist is dealing with an, antag an antagonistic force, excuse me, not necessarily a person, but the weather or the in elements of her environment. That's all part of the protagonist's problem, right? In a way, the antagonist or the antagonistic force is trying to hinder your protagonist's journey and prevent her from solving her problem. So keep that in mind as you work your way through this plot and arc alignment methodology. Now, I've got a question for all of you. At any point after today's webinar, regardless of whether you think you need help with your story's plot, with character arcs, or anything else, do you think you will need more support with your writing process? Would you be interested in learning? Ooh, so I'm guessing some of you would be interested in learning about how you and I could work together? Well, then let me share a very special offer with you. 
As one of the sponsors of the 2024 Women in Publishing Summit, I am offering one free 45-minute coaching session about your current writing project. Whether you are working on fiction, nonfiction, and yes, I work on poetry too, this free session will be tailored to the questions, concerns, or challenges you are experiencing with your project right now. Your call could in could involve a brainstorming session or a craft talk about a writing technique you are struggling with or a review of your outline or a short excerpt from your manuscript or maybe you need to want some help strategizing your writing schedule or your upcoming revisions for your story's next draft maybe you need a pep talk to help you know to help with your mindset in short whatever you need help with right now we will address it during this call. Once you book your free call and fill out the intake form, I will email you to say hello and to ask a few more questions to help me prepare for our session. This free call is typically conducted on Zoom, but I can do a phone call instead if that is more convenient for you. At the end of your free call, if you are interested in continuing your coaching on a paid basis, I would be happy to, to discuss the details with you. This offer is available to the Women in Publishing community through Monday, September 30th. So there's still plenty of time. But, you know, sometimes we forget about things that we really want to take advantage of. So if you know right now that you want to redeem this offer, I believe Amy is going to be sharing the sign-up link for this offer in the, Zoom, in the Zoom chat box. And if you're watching this on Facebook, we will make sure that you get the information that way. Um, so all you have to do is you click on the link. Once the page loads, enter your first name and email address to receive the sign-up details. When their email arrives, just click the link to visit my scheduling page and choose a day and time that works for you. Again, if you're here on Zoom, I believe Amy is going to be sharing that information on, or at least the sign up link in the Zoom chat box. And if you're on the live stream on Facebook, we will make sure that you get access to the sign up link. All right, I am going to turn off my screen sharing now. And we're going to answer some of the questions that have come in. All right. So the first one that came in, A.E., you asked, what is the dark night of the soul? Um, so I believe I answered that question during the, in my slides. Um, but AE, do you still need an answer to that question now, or are you okay with this move with the explanation I gave? Can you put that in the Zoom chat box by any chance? In the meantime, I will answer Nancy's question. Can you address knowing your protagonist six strengths and six weaknesses? Um, that, I wonder if that may be somebody else's methodology, but, um, that is those, that's something that could certainly be considered as part of like, you remember the four questions that we talked about at the beginning, who your protagonist is, what their story goal is, why they want it. So their motivation and what their false belief is during that time um it's this would be a good time to consider what strengths and weaknesses your character has and sometimes it can be helpful to choose strengths and weaknesses that are tied to perhaps their motivations or certain skills that will help them throughout the story um and the weaknesses are sort of the same thing, especially if you think about the false, you know, character's false belief. If a character, first of all, believes that they can't trust anybody, what are some of the weaknesses or what are some of the personality traits that a character who believes this might demonstrate? So sometimes looking at those four questions we talked about earlier can help you determine those strengths and weaknesses that you asked about, Nancy. 
Um, does that, Nancy, could you put in the chat box whether that helped answer your question? Awesome, thank you. Um, Camille Parkinson, if you know your story is going to be a trilogy, ooh, do you spread the ax over all three books or apply it to each book or a combination of both? I think that depends on how intricate you want that to be. Um, I would definitely say that each book in a trilogy needs to have its own separate four acts. So book one would have act one, two, three, four. That book two would have act one, act two, act three, act four. Um, and that way um, that each story feels complete on its own. Um, but you can also, as you're doing that, you can also think about how within each book of that, tri of that trilogy, um, it sort of ratchets each new conflict or each new problem that the protagonist needs to solve, ratchets things up just a little bit more. And how, um, from a character arc perspective, um, in books two and three, perhaps you could show how she, this character continues to struggle with the false belief, or maybe she's got multiple false beliefs layered on top of one another and each book um shows not only has its own story in terms of a plot but she goes through different evolutions within um within the trilogy based on all the different things the different layers within of her false beliefs that she needs to uncover um does that make sense camille if you want to put something, type something in the chat box, that would be great if you're still here. Robin Kellogg, wonderful webinar. Thank you. Thank you. I'm re And I'm seeing all the other comments that are in the chat box now. And I really, really appreciate um, every what everybody's had to say so far. Um, Camille, great. Thank you. I'm well, glad that it helped answer your question. Um, Okay, another question from Nancy. What if the historical reality is that the protagonist doesn't succeed? Aha. So, um, as I said, this webinar is just scratching the surface of this because not every story is going to show what's known as a positive character arc. That's essentially what this webinar had to focus on. Um, Sometimes your protagonist may go through what's known as a steadfast arc where um, perhaps they don't really change very much during the story. Um, or perhaps in some cases, the story shows their downfall. Um, and so in some ways there, there are ways, in those instances, such a story would need to be handled a little bit differently in terms of how the protagonist's arc progresses and perhaps, and also what happens in the story from a plot perspective. Um, and that would be a whole other hour, two hour long conversation that we simply just don't have time to have. Um, but um, it's, it in such an instance like that, Nancy, I would suggest sort of how do you, how do you look, how do you answer some of the questions that were posed for the major plot points in a way that starts to, um, in a way that eventually points to the character not succeeding or perhaps experiencing a downfall? Um, does that make sense for right now, Nancy? Maybe that's a conversation you and I can have at another time. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and yeah, Lisa in the chat box just asked something very similar. How differently do we handle a negative character arc? I would say the same thing. The, the answer I just gave to Nancy's question is the same answer I would give for your question right now. Um, just for right now, unless this is a separate conversation you and I would like to have, Lisa, um, just to on your own, look, think about the questions that were posed about each plot point. 
and how to phrase them differently in a way that would point the character toward the negative, I don't want to say negative arc, but the downfall or or um, inabil or incapability of succeeding that would happen in that kind of story. Um, can the act four act structure apply to mysteries? Yes, this methodology can apply to all genres of fiction writing. You may have to read, you know, may have to think about things a little bit differently or uniquely depending on the genre that you're writing in. But yes, it can apply to mysteries and to all branches of fiction. A -E, my, ans uh, my answer was covered. Thank you. Good. Glad to hear that the slide answered your question about the dark night of the soul. Um, I see one more question in the chat box from Marilee Oftencamp. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Should the big plot points be the main events and the rest of the content support and build to these, or are there many other events in the story as well? Um, the short answer is yes. These big plot points are the big events that happen in the story. Other things can and other other things can and will happen in the story because you obviously have to make sure that the character moves from the inciting incident to the point of no return all the way to the climax. And so, yes, other things are going to happen. Um, and perhaps some of those in-between moments will feel a little bit more momentous, but these five plot points that we covered are the major ones in, that involve uh, an important choice and an important action from the character that, um, helps them move forward. It not only helps the story move forward, but also helps them move forward as they solve their problem and um, as they go through the change that the story is leading them through. Does that make sense, Marilee? If you're still here and you want to share your answer in the chat box, that would be great, but I also see a thumbs up. That's awesome. Um, I see one more question in the chat box that I'm going to um, answer right now. Okay, thank you, Marilee. Thank you for letting me know. Um, Anand I'm so sorry. <laughs> I I am going to I am going to mispronounce your name. I'm going to do the best I can. Your last name is Baker. Ananda Mayi Baker asks, does all of this apply to children's books as well? <laughs> thank you for being understanding about that. Um, yes, it can. Um, and I th it, it's probably easier with middle grade or YA novels because you have a bigger word count that you are deal that you are working with, more story that you're working with. And um, it's hard to say the same thing with picture books or early reader books just because you're working with a much more compressed storyline and also, um, a much and a I don't want to say smaller word count, but yes, along those lines. So I think it depends on the the target age group that you are writing for, um, and how much you've got to play with in terms of your word count. Um, so if it's and if it's with a picture book, I probably wouldn't worry about it so much. But if it's for middle grade or YA, absolutely, this this methodology can be very helpful for that. Last question, people have been asking about a copy of the presentation slides. Um, Amy, do you wanna answer that question? Um, what, will the slides be made available to everybody who's here at the webinar? Hi, Sarah. So I just wanted to clarify with you if that was okay. Um, I believe we can make them available. Um, yeah, if something yeah, comes that's up. fine. And obviously, I was going to put in the chat, obviously remind everyone again of your offer link and your email address. Um, just in case uh, they can get in touch with you and Absolutely. Uh, potentially, yeah, get answers to their questions. Um, and like I said, we'll try to work out providing the slides. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. people can get in touch with you in case we can't do that. You know, you could you yeah. could send them Ab off yourself. Ab Absolutely. So I just shared in the Zoom chat box my um, contact information. So, well, at least my email address and also the link my direct link to my um, 
to the um to my sponsor offer page. So in case you're interested in taking advantage of the free um 45 minute coaching call with me about your writing project, um all you gotta do is click that link, put your name and email address in, and then once you get your confirmation email, um you will have you'll you can click the link to access my sign up page and uh, choose a day and time that works for you. Reminder, the email, I, the, the link that I posted also will work if you clicked on the link. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amy's link, link is going to work too. Place. My link or her link, it doesn't matter which one, <laughs> either one's going to work. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. As you can see, everyone was thrilled with all the information. I was sitting here typing away like a monster, writing down everything you said. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> just I'm, loved, loved I'm the so content. glad to hear that. Yeah, it's oh, I just there were so many things about it that was like definitely just like would love to pick your brain about it. But um, thank you again, just so much for this wonderful information. I know a lot of our audience members are writing books and are in the thick of it, so this is extremely helpful for that. And I know a lot of people will definitely want to get in touch with you and see your lovely face coming up next year. So thanks again yes. so much. Awesome. You are very welcome. And thank you all again for coming to today's webinar. Again, I hope you found it helpful for your project. And if you would, if you have any other questions for me, if or you would like to take advantage of that free coaching call and maybe work a little bit longer than that, just you, you got the links and um, you know where to find me. Okay. And Amy just posted it again in the chat box too. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you.